All right, everyone, welcome to another episode of the Black Real Estate Dialogue Podcast. I'm very excited for this episode today. Here with me, I have A. Donahue Baker. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Happy to be here. You know, definitely wanted to uh, be a part of this movement that you have, Sam, with your wealth of knowledge and you're bringing some relevant topics to the center. I'm just happy to be on your platform. Definitely, definitely. Uh, so first, man, uh, just give us an overview. Tell the people more about who you are and what you do. Sure, I'm a real estate developer. I'm also the co-founder of a fintech bank. Many people might not know what this is, but basically we are a wealth building platform. We help to turn thousandaires into millionaires through a number of different processes that we have in place. And we want to encourage people to be creators, entrepreneurs, and real estate developers. In essence, create generational wealth. That's what I do. I do it as a CPA. I'm also a CPA. I've done it for, for actually about 15 years now. And uh, it's just a continuation and extension of who I am. Definitely, definitely. So uh, first, tell us about, bring us back to your childhood. What was your childhood like? And what did you see? Or maybe what are some things you didn't see that ultimately shaped your view of building wealth? Yeah, good question. I tell you, I grew up in uh, affordable housing projects, right? The projects is really what they called it. My mother passed away when I was 10 years old. And as a result, it really affected the dynamics from which I grew up. And, um, you know, I grew up in poverty. We were on welfare. We struggled to uh, meet basic necessities of needs. So I had this kind of chip on my shoulder because I was surrounded by poverty that I had to get out. And I wanted to observe from people, how did they get out? And it, you know, one of the ways that I found that they got out was really through education. So I just began to do things differently. I just took school a little bit differently, and uh, you know, that, that was my avenue to get out of uh, the the projects, quote unquote, and staying out of trouble. Because there's so many pitfalls. Once you make a decision here, it's like you know, you go down this road and it's hard to turn back. You know, so it's a it's a you know, a lot of young particularly African-American males have to make these decisions at such an early age before our brain is really fully capable of really being uh, making solid decisions and, and we find ourselves in a pinch. So by the grace of God, I was able to make some pretty good decisions and I had some people in my life that helped me along the way too. So uh, that, that's kind of how I was able to kind of put, get on the right track. Sure, for sure. So, uh, so how'd you get into real estate? You know, a lot of people, you know, who grow up in our communities, it's kind of just this, 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 this big thing that, you know, you, you need to be rich to conquer, or that's just flat out impossible. So um, it's just coming from where you came from. How, how did you find yourself being able to invest in real estate? How did that start for you? It, it was an accident, to be honest. With you. <laughs> I looked at people that made money in real estate. But for me, it wasn't until I, I was, I, was, I grew up, I was in the music industry. So it started this journey where I started to do music and I had some successes. I was nominated for a Grammy and the very first check, that was a six figure check that I got. I noticed my peers, when they got a six figure check, they would take it, they would buy jewelry, you know, buy cars, depreciable assets, right? And I wanted to do something different. And what I did was I bought a six unit apartment complex in North New Jersey. And that changed the trajectory because when the music career kind of went south where that money dried up, I had a steady income and that really gave me a platform to do other things. When I wasn't so dependent on you know living day to day, I was able to make better financial decisions. Wow, wow, that's, that's very key, that's very key. It's, it's crazy because you know, we see people getting big checks. We see, and I'm, I mean, you were in the industry, so you, you've seen it every day. You know, why, why did you decide to go a different route? You know, it could have been so easy just to spend all of the money on, you know, luxuries and, and things that you could lose any day. What, what was it for you that was like, you know what, I'm gonna go a different route? Just by observing, right? So if you look at the way that people, really particularly at that time, like you're 20 years old, and that, that's the age I was at that particular point in time. I was like, you know what? This may be the very last check that I get. And I didn't have much. And at that particular point in time, you know, when you don't have a lot and then you get a lot, the propensity is 
to realize this may be the only time that I get this money and I wanted it to last. So I wasn't really flashy with the jewelry. I wasn't, even though I did have a car, I'd much rather have a car that was more less flashy that just got me from point A to point B instead of buying a hundred thousand dollar car. I just wanted to have residual income, income that pays me every single month. And that's what that, that's what my first property did. It, it just allowed me to be, uh, to have a certain lifestyle that wasn't flashy, but every single month I had money coming in, whether I worked for it or not. And doing that and seeing other people do it made me realize that this is the way to go. Definitely. So what, what was it like, um, I guess, just being early on, finding that property, um, you mentioned six units, which is which is pretty large for for your mm -hmm. first uh, for your first purchase. Uh, so talk us through that. Like, what, what was that experience like? Just going through that whole purchasing process. Yeah, it really wasn't hard. And I mean, at the time, um, <laughs> you know, this was like the '90s. I, I'll be completely honest with you. In Newark, New Jersey, you can get a six unit. It's like you know, shooting fish in a barrel. Like it's there was it, there were many of those around, many of them, right? And at that particular time, I got a really sweet deal. It was one hundred and thirty thousand dollars. I got a six-unit apartment complex, which is a steal. That same building I still own today is worth over seven hundred thousand dollars. But that was back then. But now, I mean, it's you know gentrification. Things were coming up, property values increase. So um, it was just a different time. I was just glad that I had the wherewithal to make that purchase. Now, when I made that purchase. I set a goal for myself. I said every single year I wanted to double the number of units. So I just kept doubling and doubling and doubling to the point where I am today. I own over 500 units. Um, I realized at some point I had to get away from the smaller apartment buildings and scale up into apartment complexes. And that was a journey all in of itself. I just had to basically have a different mindset. How do I find able to, uh, basically analyze these deals because after you find them you got to make sure they're profitable right so i had to really teach myself um with the help of a mentor too is by the way but I, I i found out how to analyze them effectively and then eventually a skill that also needs to be developed is how do you fund those deals how do you acquire them where do you find the money to purchase a five unit a five million dollar apartment building where do you find the money to purchase a $10 million apartment building? That is another education all in itself. 100%, definitely. So you mentioned um, that your goal from that point on, well, actually first, um, at that time, were you like, all right, this is like, I know New Jersey, I'll buy something here. Like, was there any formula that went into it? Because obviously, I don't, you probably couldn't foresee, you know, like I was in Newark, I was back, back East a couple months ago, mm -hmm. a friend of mine bought a property out there you see it, right? You see everything, mm -hmm. right? Um, so at, I guess at the time, were you like, all right, I just need to buy something. Here seems familiar. Let me just buy it. Or were you like, maybe this could be something one day? No, I really didn't have the wherewithal to say, maybe yeah. this could be something one day, to be honest. I had the formula was, if I purchase this building, am I going to make more money this year than I did last? And it was very simple. I bought it for $130,000 at the time. Uh, each bed, each um, unit was two bedroom. Uh, actually, no, I'm sorry. Each unit was three bedroom. And at that time, a three bedroom rents for about $750, $750 a month. And based on the mortgage payment, based on the taxes, I was making about 2000 uh, almost $3,000 a month net. And that just, it just made sense to me. So I was like, all right, let me go ahead and do it. Now, granted, the time I bought the, the property, it was a different, the neighborhood looked a little different. Now it's a lot better now. Actually, Queen Latifah has a building right across the street nice. from that. So a lot of the neighborhood has changed, lots of development coming up. Um, you know, a lot of money has been poured in, but I was, the, I was like the first, I was there yeah. first, right? So I went through this cycle where I had the FBI kick in my door. I've had tenants that, uh, you know, did some not so nice things along the way. But all in all, I made money every single year, even in the face of those adversities. So, and I always tell people, real estate is really, really forgiving, right? As long as you don't make one mistake. And the one mistake you can't make in real estate is purchasing a property at the wrong price, right? Either paying more than market, or right now I'm telling people, do not pay market. 
price for real estate because we're seeing prices go up and up. But if you pay too much for a property, it's really hard to get enough tenants in there to recoup. You know, it messes the ratios up. Things are just way, you know, it, it just doesn't work. So as long as you buy at the right price, you can have a bad tenant. You can go through a catastrophe. You can have a fire in your place. You won't lose that much money. It'll always be recoupable. Love it. I love it. So started with a six unit. How did things grow and develop in the years following that? So like I said, I just doubled every single year. Yeah. Right. So I went from a six unit to like a 10 unit. Then I got like one, one year I did like a two. I bought like three, four plexes. Right. Wow. Um, so once I got about six or seven mortgages on my personal credit, I realized I couldn't get a loan anymore because <laughs> the banks, even though I, you know, I didn't default on any of the loans or anything like that, but the banks would not lend me after I got to a certain point. And that was really tough, right? So I had to be creative. And that's when I found other means to get financing for a particular project. Um, and we can go into that right now. Like I definitely developed a, a really, I call it a mastery of business credit. Right. And when I found that out, it was like, all right, this is a way in which I can create these entities. And the entities are like really cloning my personal self. Right. Because I had good credit. If I create an entity that had good credit, I can use the entity to get more money and really leverage and scale up. And that's exactly what happened. That trick right there alone allowed me to, to basically go from about 50 units all the way up to about 200. Wow. Wow. And, and, you know, business credit, it's like something that's floated around, right? This, this thing that we hear about people using to invest in real estate. Um, so I would love if you could talk, talk more about that and, and, you know, what, I guess, what, what are some steps people can take to explore that opportunity, uh, particularly those, you know, with, with good personal credit and, and, and all those things. Okay. So before I jump into that, I've got to talk to you about, um, my philosophy, right? Yeah, of course. And, and, and the reason why I want to say that is because a lot of that philosophy affects what happens in business credit. And it also affects what, so I have a book, it's called The Skyscraper to Generational Wealth. And what people need to realize from that book is it's literally like building a building. It's like one foundation goes on another, on another. And eventually, once you scale up, you're sitting on massive amount of wealth. So what I believe is that the way to properly become a millionaire, right, is leveraging debt. And you have to understand debt and you have to be comfortable with debt. Now, some people along the way get in trouble with their credit and they can't handle credit cards and they can't handle debt. So what they do is they say, oh, I'm not going to get in any debt. I'm scared to uh, accumulate debt. But the equivalent of that is, let's say you were 18, you got into a car accident. Is the right approach going to be, I am not going to get into a car ever again because I was in a car accident? No, I don't think that would be logical, right? Basically, you just have to figure out how to use debt correctly. And one of the best ways to use, use debt correctly is through a separate legal entity. So when I talk a lot of times, I speak specifically about the power of the LLC. And people say, what do you mean when you say, well, what is the power of the LLC? Well, I'll tell you, it's just like this. I believe that every individual should bring their personal credit score to 720. Once you get to 720, you lock it. When you lock it, that means you just don't use it anymore. You live exclusively through your business, exclusively through your business. If you're able to do that, you're going to accomplish some things. Number one, because you're living exclusively through your business, meaning that if you need to take a trip, that's a tax write-off. If you need to go to uh, around town, you know, burn gas, that's a tax write-off. If you need to go out to dinner with your spouse to talk about your business, it's a tax write-off. If you need clothes, you got to look good, right? It's a tax write-off. If you do that, and you have all those expenses, what you do is you limit your tax liability. If you limit your tax liability, you pay less taxes. If you pay less taxes, you keep more of the money and put it into your business and you can invest more into your business to make even more money, right? So there's a philosophy behind it. But the other side of it, people got that. Most people understand that, that 
that concept that I just broke down of living exclusively through your business. But I know people, and as a CPA, I've had people and clients that have hundreds of LLCs, but what they're not doing is tapping into the business credit side of your LLC because you have a legal entity. So just like you are a legal entity, your business is a legal entity. And that legal entity has the ability to get credit. So when I started my company, Money App, which is the FinTech Bank, one of the things that we tap in and one of the things that we do is help people make that connection. So I say that if anyone out there that has an LLC that doesn't have at least $100,000 of business credit that is not tied to their personal credit profile, they're not utilizing the power of the LLC. So that's how, how I got into that. Now I'm gonna jump into your question, yeah. right? <laughs> so I have a $3 million line, business line of credit that's tied directly to my business and not to my personal credit profile. And we talk about the masters of business credit. We talk about people like Donald Trump, um, people that, you know, when Donald Trump, when he filed for bankruptcy in 91 and 92, the very same week that he filed for bankruptcy, he set up other businesses, other LLCs and leveraged those businesses for millions and millions of dollars. What is so important in that is that 90% of businesses fail. If you know the odds are against you that your business is gonna fail, why would you leverage your personal credit? It's just not the safest way to go. So that's why I say when you live exclusively through your business, you realize the benefits, you build that, you tap into the power of the LLC, you, 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 you build out your business credit, you can get millions and millions of dollars on that business credit. I've done it. I want to show other people how to do it. And that's why I have this wealth building platform called Money Avenue, because we show people how to tap into that potential, the hidden potential of the LLC. It's complicated to an extent because we guarantee everyone $50,000, right? So that $50,000 that we get for your business, that business credit, that's just the entry into the party. The real fun begins when you start to get higher lines of credit. And that's really where you see the skill set of a CPA, the skill set of a business professional, that we structure your entity. We build the ecosystem of, of, of really businesses and LLCs that do business with each other to qualify you to get these higher, higher lines of business credit. And that's how I was able to do it. But anyone can do it really if you have the structures in place. I know I was long winded on yeah, that, no, you're but good. I wanted you're to good, make man. sure Thank you I went time. back so you can understand the philosophy, right? Because I can give you a one sentence answer, but sometimes it you, you, won't, you won't connect the dots. And I like to be crystal, crystal clear. So please forgive my long windedness. <laughs> no, that was good. That was good. I appreciate you. It, that all made a lot of sense. I'm glad you went back to that actually, because it made the last part make complete sense. Um, man, so that's great. That's great, man. Um, <clears throat> So as you got into like the larger units, was it like a combination of leveraging business credit, like raising private capital? Because, you know, as you get into, as you mentioned, those larger, like multi-million dollar deals, mm -hmm. it's different money you're talking about. So I guess what Absolutely. what um, what worked for you as, in terms of um, taking down those larger deals? So when I first started, I was like, you know, I needed to come up with uh, being able to raise at least a couple million dollars. And the easiest way to do it at that particular time was to leverage my network. And I figured the best way to do that is do the syndication business model. So that's what, that was one way that I did. I don't do syndications anymore. Can you talk about, I don't, we haven't really had people talk about, I don't think, yeah, we haven't really had people talk too much about syndications. Could you, could you like yeah. define what that, what that is for those who may not be familiar with it? Sure. So in the syndication, basically you're raising money from other people and there's a structure. You have uh, what's called a GP, which is the person that kind of puts everything together and they're kind of like on the hook. Then you have a, a number of other investors below them called an LP, right? Limited partners. And they're basically partners, but they're not equivalent to the GP. So, the GP is the one that actually signs the legal documents and things like that. The LPs, they just contribute cash and they could own a percentage of the deal, but that's the, the legal structure for it. And then 
basically you're out raising money. So let's say you, uh, you're purchasing a building for uh, $10 million, right? And you have to come up, you're financing 70% of that, you have to come up with $3 million. Uh, at that point, you have to basically go out and raise $3 million from different maybe friends and family, or you know, you could if the other trick is if you're trying to do that, you can come to Money Ave because we have, and we'll talk about that later. Yeah. We have a way in which we can support young up and coming real estate developers where you get that money. But let's say it was before Money Ave, right? Basically how you would do it is go through your phone and you probably would have friends and family and you'll you'll go to your uncle and say, hey Unc, I need I need a couple hundred thousand. Then you go to a friend from college and you say, you know what, you got a good job. You got some savings. Uh, I need a couple hundred thousand. And that's how you eventually you do that until you get to two or three million that you need to close the deal. So in essence, that's the, the basic breakdown of what a syndication business model looks like. It's, uh, you know, you have to make sure that you're covered legally, right? So you have a subscription agreement, which will tell you you know, all of this is, is regulated by the SEC, right? So you have to have a subscription agreement. You have to have an operating agreement, which defines the new legal entity that you create. And then you have to have a PPE, which is um, abbreviation for a private placement memorandum. That is a legal document just spelling out all the risk. You know, those are key pieces, key documents that you need. You usually get those from an attorney. And they're not cheap. Like just putting together that legal, those three key legal documents may cost you twenty thousand dollars. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, you know, it, there's 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 different hurdles, you know, that you have to go through. But it's one way in which you know, if you have a network, you can raise a lot of money, and that's one way. A way in which I would never do is another form is now. Uh, since o the Obama administration, they passed the crowdfunding laws. So some people have tried to do the crowdfunding. Um, I'm not a fan of that. So uh, I've never tried it, probably never will. It definitely seems like a headache. The way that I raise money now, is I'm tied into high net worth individuals. So because I'm tied into high net worth individuals, I'm able to tap into the resources of hedge funds that control billions of dollars. And when you have billions of dollars, you're always looking for a place to park your money to get a decent return, right? Mm -hmm. So that's an opportunity for other investors or other people that are out there, you know? And let me tell you, let me just, uh, uh, if I'm not too long winded oh, again, no. I wanna make you understand as well as everyone else, how difficult it is to, uh, to get a decent return when you have one of these billion dollar hedge funds. And this is a, from a conversation that I spoke to, um, I spoke to a hedge fund manager. I actually know two hedge fund managers that each one of them control over $4 billion of assets. And they're looking to put this money into play. But I spoke to one of them and they said, you know, um, you know, when we were, were, were growing, you know, we could get at least 30 to 40% return on maybe three, four million dollars, really easy, right? In, in a short amount of time, you know, like in a short amount of time, meaning uh, six periods or six months, right? But when you have a billion dollars, it's like almost impossible to get a 30, you know, 30% 30 return on that volume of money. So they always, they're constantly looking for what is the best way to do that. So it's like the more successful you become, it's like the harder it is to perform and get the return that you need. So that's why if you have a real deal, a profitable real estate deal, the bigger it is, the better it is, the easier it is to raise that money. And that's what I try to tell my students. That's what I try to tell people, you know, if you have a really good deal, uh, think big. And that's what we need to think about. Think big because I can get easier, I can, I can get funded easier on a hundred million dollar deal than I can on a, you know, two, three, four unit building that, that's going for like six hundred, seven hundred thousand dollars $700,000. It's easier for me to get that hundred million dollars at this point because of what I know and it's all knowledge and I try to share it, but any investor can put a group together and do the exact same thing. Definitely, definitely. 
man, that's game right there. That's game right there. Um, so as you as you got into like the larger buildings, like what are some challenges you experienced along the way um, as you scale? Because it seemed like you scaled relatively um, quickly. So I guess what were some uh, challenges that I you made? Overcame? I made it look like light work. I made it look like you made it look work. like light work, man. <laughs> Um, it wasn't exactly light work, but I'll mm -hmm. tell you one of the one of the key challenges was getting funded and picking the right structures. Mm -hmm. That is key. The reason why I went through some hassle with the syndication business model because when you when when you're in syndication, you literally have partners. Like all of those investors become your partners, and then some of them, you know, some of them have different goals or different timelines than you have. So we and what we do is we have a certain criteria on the assets that we acquire. And I'll run through that real quick because the criteria hasn't changed for the last 10 years. What I look for is value add real estate, I never pay market value to it. Um, in terms of apartment buildings, I don't purchase below 50 units. So it has to be 50 units and up. We have to be able to spot the defect so that we can use our strategies to create forced appreciation. That's how we, uh, and this is, this is true story. I bought a apartment building for $5.6 million at the end of last year. Today, it's worth over 12 million. We won't, wouldn't be able to do that if we didn't have the strategies of forced appreciation, very key. So we look for those opportunities and, and basically it's like a check, like we check the boxes on these things when we analyze them, right? So we analyze them, we look for a certain set of criteria and that's when we know we have a great deal. I'm only looking to do one deal a year completely honest if it's a great year if i do two but i'm only looking to do one deal a year got it got it so you are you at the point where it's like it has to meet this very specific criteria it doesn't matter if we have to look through dozens and dozens and dozens we have to wait until we find exactly what works for for, for our strategy absolutely so i underwrite lots of deals i look at lots of deals people send me lots of deals unfortunately i get so much deals i can't look at everyone's deal so i try to uh, just give them advice, right? I try to make sure that they do the analysis and all I'm doing is 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 checking to make sure that they made the right assumptions, checking and do, and just making sure based on my knowledge of where they are, that they are along the right path. And if they do that, it basically cuts down my time. But like the type of person that calls me up and says, I have a deal and they're sending me a deal on the MLS and they want me to do the analysis. They want me to create the pro forma. And I mean... <laughs> Come on, <laughs> it's your deal, Yo, do the work, yeah. <laughs> do the work. But um, I still get that, believe it or not, like three or four times every single week, um, you know, somebody that is, is not really prepared to do the work. That's the type of real estate investor that is gonna have a hard time acquiring apartment complexes because you have to do the analysis and you have to spot the defect. I can't do it from my city you need to be boots on the ground, find out, find the deal, do the analysis. And then if you need the money, then you can come to me and, and we can talk about that. Then I can help you, you know, but you have to find, you have to find the deal. You need to meet with your local municipality, city officials, find out if there's any opportunity, find out if there's any money there allotted, if there's an affordable housing component, or if there's any grant money that can be put in, any tax credits, anything for a RAB or a pilot tax or any opportunity. You have to do the research. That's how you become wealthy. 100%, 100%. So the, the mentality, the scope, when you're looking at big buildings that are like big, big complexes, like 50 units and so, it's very different than like a three, four family house, right? Um, and, you know, using an FHA loan and things of that nature. So can you talk more about just like the work it takes to find those kind of deals, um, the work it takes to vet those kind of deals as well? Um, just because, you know, you could assume there's just a lot more factors and different things you're looking for in a sense. Absolutely. So in a way, they're not really different, right? Like a mm. hundred unit apartment complex from a four unit apartment complex is really only different in size. But the analysis, the paperwork, the things that you need are literally the same exact thing. You're just dealing with difference in scope. So what I tell people is understand how to analyze a deal. There's certain things that you need. For me personally, a lot of people pay a lot of attention to cap rate. You know, I want to know what the cap rate is, but it's not a key metric for me, right? I want to know what my, my 
ROI is, what my cash on cash return is. I want to know why is this property available? Why is it coming on market now? What's the narrative? What's the backstory? Is there a death in the family? Is there a divorce? I mean, those are the things that really motivate people to sell. One of the things that I do is I basically understand why is trying to get in the mind of the seller. Why are they trying to sell? Because that's where the opportunity becomes. So one of the greatest opportunities that I got was I basically found a seller that was, you know, he was just old, you know, it was an older guy that was looking to sell. And because he was older, he said, look, I can't manage this anymore. I'm going to go to Florida, retire, and live the rest of my life where it is. And he said, look, I um, gave him a, through, he said, give me an offer. I threw out an offer and it was a low ball offer. And he said, yes. One of the best deals that I've ever made, right? Just yeah. by asking, just by putting out that offer, finding, doing the, 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 the research, the due diligence, finding that property it wasn't listed. It wasn't like a broker called me with it. I just went out and, and looked, found this property and said, look, this is an apartment building that I would love to own. And then I contacted the owner. Definitely, definitely. Um, would you say a lot of the people who invest with you are repeat investors? Like they've invested on previous deals and they just kind of um, keep their money rolling into new opportunities that come up? Um, I, I personally, when, when I did my syndication deal, I was like, I don't ever want to do another syndication deal again. So when it's time for me to find investors, I partner with high net worth individuals, hedge funds. Um, we actually have our own fund at Money Avenue right now. Okay. We have a $10 million fund that, you know, we partner with other people. We try to be the, the you know, one of the hard things is coming up with that friends and family piece, right? That 30, sometimes 40% that you need to put into a deal, that equity. If someone has a great deal, they come to us, we can provide that and we'll still let you be the, um, the, the owner, right? You'll still have ownership. But if we're bringing all the money to the table, you know, of course that's gonna, you know, we're gonna be a majority owner, but you'll still own, you can learn, we can sponsor you and it'll be easier for you on your next deal. So that's how we are able to give knowledge, but also give our money and our resources. 100%. So this is also the first time we've had somebody on the show with the actual fund. Um, mm -hmm. so I think that's really cool. Uh, so I'd love to hear just more about, uh, more about the fund, more about why you decided to start the fund and, I mean, honestly, you know, you feel free to talk about like the kind of deals you're looking for, for anybody, you know, perhaps we have a listener who, who could be, you know, tap into some of those funds and bring you a good deal. All right, great. So great segue. So <laughs> yes, we have a fund. It's, it's a $10 million fund. It's more like an angel syndicate, right? So the idea is to find young up and coming real estate developers or entrepreneurs. Now we've invested, actually this year, we've invested in um, four entrepreneurs and about six real estate developers, right? That have projects that we like the projects, we invested in, in their projects, but then it's not just real estate, it's also people that are looking to start businesses. So that, that's really it. So the science behind it is if you have a product or a real estate deal that we like, we basically make an equity investment in exchange for equity. On the real estate side, we understand that there's some, you know, maybe some nuances there and that many of the people that have deals don't have the money. So what we do is if you have a deal, what we can do is we can take care of the equity side, 100% of it in exchange for, you know, a, a percentage of equity. And then we can also get you a line of credit through the bank or we can also get you an additional loan through the bank of some, some way to kind of like take care of soft costs, right? As a developer, there's a number of different soft costs that you have to basically use to get to the finish line. So we can help with that. If you're in our program, if you're in our coaching, we definitely provide an outlet for that. In fact, I have 20 students right now that, I've, um, that I'm coaching and we're on the verge of securing a 400 unit apartment complex deal and the whole group, the whole 20, they're all going to be owners, but we, it's not locked and loaded yet. So yeah. I got to cross my fingers on that, but this is what we do every single Tuesday. We sit down and we chop up and analyze real estate opportunities. 
Definitely. Love it. Love it. Um, and can you talk to us also more about your transition into uh, real estate development? Yeah, absolutely. So once you um, set out to set a goal and you're going to say you're going to double the number of units you have every single year, you'll quickly realize you get to a point where, you know, I'm at 500 units. There's no 500 unit development out there right now, right? I have to go and build it myself. So that's what led to the transition into development. So now I'm developing, I'm looking for opportunities and, and, and building from ground up. So one of the things that I'm working on is student housing, I'm doing a 200 unit apartment complex in student housing. I'm also working on the deal that we just said, it's opportunity where we can do 400 units. Um, that's something that I'm working on. It's a, we just we just threw our best shot. Hopefully, it's good enough, and we get through a couple of the the uh, municipal hurdles. And that's a project that we're going to get started early in 2021. But that's really it. We're looking for opportunity. We're looking for assemblances of land that allow us to leverage our ability to get number one affordable housing. That's my my specialty, right? Because there's government money out there. So we can use some of that money to kind of lessen the, the capital stack, so to speak, right? So there's a number of grants and, and whatever city that you're in, the, the key thing that you have to realize is you should go down to your municipality, go into the zoning office, find out what is needed, ask for the master plan. If you look at the master plan, the master plan will tell you what's needed in your municipality. It could be veterans housing, could be affordable housing, could be student housing, could be any type of housing. You know, the bottom line is you want to find out what's needed and you want to give it to them. Because if you give the town what they need, then they in turn will give you uh, tax breaks. You could possibly even get money. Like a lot of times we develop for towns. When we develop, sometimes towns will invest their own money. The taxpayers money, you know, millions of dollars to see something done, right? So that's what we're doing. And, uh, you know, I just wanna let people know, need to be aware of all opportunities, but it's unique. It's like the same thing uh, that you may see in New York City may not be needed in LA or Dallas or Houston or Atlanta, you know? So you just have to understand what's needed in your town. Sure, and I like that you mentioned that um, cause I was gonna ask kind of how you, how do you figure out what to build, where to build? But I mean, I'm glad you mentioned the piece of just seeing what the need is. Um, I think it's, I definitely agree that that is uh, very, very important. Um, I guess in development, what are what are some challenges, I guess, unexpected challenges that you've overcome and that you've experienced? Because I mean, I, I would just imagine there's a lot, uh, you know, it's a longer process, a uh, longer time horizon in some cases um, than potentially maybe than purchasing like a, a apartment complex. So I would just love to hear hear more about that. Yeah, I mean, really with development, it's just the, the initial risk is very high, but the reward is also great. So we talked a little bit about the soft costs. Like what do we have to do, the due diligence that, that you have to basically, the money that you have to spend before you even break ground, right? There's environmental costs. Sometimes we have to get a phase one, phase two report. Um, a lot of towns, they want the traffic study, right? If you're putting in, a uh, 200 unit apartment complex, they want, to, they want to find out how that affects traffic. You got to pay for that as a developer. You know, um, you need to, it's a number of different soft costs that have to come initially. And then the other thing is, is that sometimes there's pushback from the town. So you need to figure out what the town needs, right? Because if you have the idea with saying, look, I just want to put this building up the town may not want it. I know places in Texas, they don't want affordable housing. So if you go there and try to put affordable housing, you're not gonna be able to get a permit, right? So no, and everything may be 100% legal, but for some reason, the powers that be do not want you to succeed. So they're gonna make things very difficult for you. So these are the things, these are the factors that go into it. Then once you even get across the finish line, the next big hurdle is cost. Right. You want to make sure that you can bring your costs under control. If you have the right trade in place, people that are very sensitive to time, because when you get money, that money that you're using to build, you have to pay interest on that every single month. So the idea is to get out of that phase as quickly as possible so you can get to the next iteration or the next tranche of, uh, of development. Definitely. 
Definitely. And for those development costs, like, is it common to use like bank financing, um, raising private money, hard money, um, all of these? Yeah, you can, yeah, you can do a combination of it. So basically in the capital stack, sometimes there's like senior debt or mezzanine What's debt, a, various levels of debt. Sorry to cut you off. What Can you explain what a capital stack is too? Yeah. So the capital stack is just basically, um, you know, the full vertical of what you have to raise, right? So it could start with your equity, your cash contribution, right? Then on top of that, you may have another level of debt that could be some type of mezzanine debt. Then on top of that, you could have uh, some bank financing or, you know, if, if you, you know, depending on the type of deal that you're doing, it's just, you know, it's just the full vertical of what you have to do to totally acquire the property and how are you going to do it financially? That's what I, when I say your capital stack, that's really what I mean. It's the full vertical, of every cash contribution that you need to make uh, the full components of it. Got it. Got it. That makes sense. That makes sense. So are you, are you primarily um, investing and developing in New Jersey? I'm in three States, right? So Florida, Atlanta, Georgia, and New Jersey is that's basically places that I have teams places that I have uh, management companies and, you know, ready to deploy should the right opportunity come. But that doesn't mean that with the right deal, I won't go to another state, but, um, but that's where I've been, uh, been successful at. And that's where I have teams. Dope, dope. Can you talk more about, um, I guess, expanding into um, New Jersey and into, um, into Georgia and kind of what, what brought you there to those markets? Sure. So I used to live in Georgia. Actually, my okay. first property was in Georgia. Oh, cool. cool right. Okay. So then, uh, but I was born in New Jersey. So I left Georgia uh, and came back to New Jersey. And, you know, it's my hometown. Yeah. And, uh, and then I, then I, then it started from there. And then uh, the Florida deal, somebody came up with an incredible deal for me and I jumped on it and that's the deal in Florida. And that's basically how it ended up in all three places. Nice, nice, man. And I'm still looking for deals right now. So if something yeah. like if something comes outside of that, eventually I will go to a new market and make a team there. Hey, if anyone listening has deals, large deals, you know, you, <laughs> this is your guy. <laughs> uh, it's awesome, man. That's awesome. Um, can you talk more about the affordable housing piece? I feel like there's a, a stigma sometimes on uh, affordable housing and, and, you know, as you mentioned, some people don't want them in their neighborhood, but, you know, there's still a need for it, right? And you can still benefit financially from mm -hmm. provi from providing it. Um, and, you know, obviously people can benefit from receiving it. So can you talk more about, about that part, that piece of it? Yeah, so affordable housing is something that's near and dear to me because, uh, you know, I grew up in affordable housing, you know, call it the projects, call it whatever you want. It's just, uh, um, it, it's a, uh, did I lose you for no, a second? you good. All right, good. So uh, it's something that is definitely near and dear to my heart. So I just feel as though, and especially in the face of COVID, and many people don't realize how valuable affordable housing is because affordable housing is that safety net. If we get rid of that, I think the next step below that is homelessness. So I believe in the way that I take it is I'm providing a valuable service to people giving them a great place to live, giving them a place they can be proud of, making them feel like this is a place, despite my predicament, it's an opportunity for me to have a home that is you know, clean. That's the idea. That's what we try to, uh, try, to, try to establish when we have affordable housing. For sure, for sure. So before we get into you know, everything else you have going on, because you spoke a bit off camera, you do a whole lot. Um, uh -huh. Could you give some tips for someone who wants to get into large apartment complexes um, or get into real estate development? What are some things that they should be doing just to prepare for getting into those, those larger deals? Number one, education, right? It's so important that you analyze deals consistently because if you do that, you're gonna be able to spot a great deal when it appears. Right. Do not look on uh, the MLS and say these are the best deals. Understand that they are, but understand that the best opportunities come off market. The best opportunities come from developing a relationship with a broker and that broker 
usually has a pocket listing when something becomes available and they call like their top five people. And if their top five people pass, then it ends up somewhere else. But the best deals don't end up on the MLS. They don't end up in LoopNet. So you need to understand that. And then you need to have a system of acquiring those deals, right? And that's basically the, the, the way that I was able to do it. And that's why I don't purchase market value properties because it becomes uh, it, it just be, it, it's not a profitable situation. Like those are the deals that no one wants, right? When, when they end up there, it becomes a place where newbie investors uh, get taken advantage of. So I want that to kind of be out there so that people know that, you know, LoopNet is, is not the, it, it's not the hookup, <laughs> you know, it's not the hookup. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Um, so you do, you do a whole lot in addition to uh, real estate, uh, you yeah, the fintech bank. Um, you do a whole lot of things. You, you're a CPA. Um, you know, so talk to us more about everything else you have going on. You, you seem to be a jack of all trades. No, it's not really a jack of all trades. It's all the same, believe it or not. It's yeah. real estate. If you look at it like this, mm -hmm. and this is the, this is a perfect segue into the bank, right? So we heard about Killer Mike. He's starting mm -hmm. a bank, right? Mm -hmm. All right, so we're, we're basically doing the same thing, but he's starting a digital bank. We've been working on our digital bank for over a year. We're finally at the point where we're starting to launch. We're gonna launch in January, 2021. But our bank is just so much more than a bank. We're a wealth building platform. You, if you bank with us, the people that are out there that wanna listen, if you bank with us, we are gonna help you build wealth. And this is how we do it. Open an account with us. If you want to open an account with us, you can find us at bankmoneyav.com. If you get a savings or checking account, there's no fee. There's no minimum balance. In addition to that, if you need to transfer money, there's no fee on that. If you have a direct deposit in your that you get your paycheck via direct deposit, normally you let's say you get paid on Friday. If you bank with us, that money will be available on Wednesday for you. And of course, everything is FDIC insured. That's why it's taking so long because we had to jump through these hoops. Yeah. But, um, but everything is FDIC insured. So your money is, in, is just as safe as it is in Chase, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, TD Bank, Citibank, all of those banks is equivalent, safety-wise. It's the same insurance that protects your, your money there, protects your money when you bank with money app. So, you know, the things that we can do is just that, but it goes well deeper than that. We want to ensure people own homes. We want to ensure that they own income producing assets. So we have special loans that if you're looking to have income producing assets, these loans are sure, they're gonna be approved at a much higher rate than a regular bank. Why? Because we're investing our own money to make them happen. We got warehouse lines that we've, installed to make sure people can get these residential loans that we can close the wealth gap hopefully by encouraging more home ownership right we talked earlier about one of the great wealth creators the way great wealth builders in real estate but we also want to show you how to take advantage of the tools such as business credit we said get to 720 live exclusively through your, your business credit. And then we're gonna help people build out their business credit to the point where we have the capabilities to give you a money app credit card. This money app credit card can have a high value, $100,000 credit limit, right? But the idea is we want you to be a creator. We want you to be a real estate developer, entrepreneur, something that creates generational wealth because that's the idea of our bank, right? And then the next level is that once you do that, you have to be put yourself in a position where you can pass that wealth on. We have life insurance. If you can get life insurance, you can change the scope of your family. You remove the uncertainty that comes with death. You know these 20, 20 year old, you know, we're losing young people in our community by the dozens, you know? Not only the string of uh, hip hop artists, rappers passed away, you know, getting shot, but I personally feel like at 20 years old, you can get $100,000 life insurance for $20 a month. I mean, that's like 
two days lunch, two, two sandwiches, you know what I'm saying? At Subway, you know, the fact of the matter is if somebody told you that you're going to leave this earth and you did not know, you want to make sure that your family is protected. Yeah. We just want to educate our community. We want to increase the dialogue. We want to let people know that it's cool to build generational wealth, that it's okay to plan. It's okay to talk about death. It's okay to have life insurance. Very, very key. Another tool that we have is we show people through educational um, courses that we're going to have on Money App, right? We're going to show you what a 1031 exchange is, how to pull money out of properties. We're going to show you how to set up trust so you can safely, the assets and the wealth that you've built along your life, we're going to show you how to transfer it to your ears, right? That it doesn't have a tremendous tax burden. These are things that if you be a part of this movement called Money Avenue, it's going to be a tremendous blessing to you. So, you know, I just want to let people know that it's so much stuff coming down the pike, um, not immediately in January or February, but also one other thing is we have auto insurance. Did you know that if you live in a predominantly black community, you're paying a higher auto insurance rate? We're trying that. to, that's the facts. We're wow. trying to fix that problem. Yeah. So this is, you know, we, we have a lot of things. We're trying to cure problems. One of the one of our most popular products that we have is you can get a loan anywhere from $500 all the way to $10,000 in as little as three hours through Money Ave. And we set this product out so we can go after the payday lenders because it's a low interest rate loan, two and 3% interest, and you can get anywhere from 500 to $10,000. So why would you go to a pawn shop? Why would you go to the check cash in place that's gonna charge you 30, 40% interest? You know, this is what we want to try to do. We want to try to impact our community. And I hope people out there are financially sound and smart enough to take advantage of, of these great products that we have. Man, that's, that's, that's incredible. That's incredible, man. Because, you know, you know how it is. Like a lot of us spend time just talking about how we don't like how things are, talking about what other people haven't done for us, but you know, I think just the fact that you and, and those working with you are starting a bank, you just listed out a bunch of problems that it can solve. Um, mm -hmm. So shout out to you, man. I think it's a great idea. I can't wait. I can't wait to support it. Um, I can't wait to tell our listeners about it. I think that's that's a great move, man. That's a really great move. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm looking forward for you to support it because, you know, we, we, we need to get the word out. We need to let mm -hmm. people know because... The thing is, is that these opportunities are out there and it's just like there's so much grant money out there, but a lot of people don't know about it. So they don't apply for the grants. So what happens at the end of the year, it gets expired and the opportunity gets wasted. I don't want that to happen with money app. So I'm going to lean on you, brother. And that, yeah. that's what you're going to hit for me, Sam. I definitely need to get this out. You know, definitely want to work with you on it. Definitely, 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 man. Um, is there anything, uh, can you tell us more about, I guess, any services you offer? I know you mentioned like coaching or any other like products or different ways people can tap in with uh, what you have going on. Sure. So I have a uh, Facebook, private Facebook group. It's called the Generational Wealth Builders Inner Circle. So every, you know, so often I go in there, we do lives, we give information. Um, definitely join that. That's one thing. Also, you can follow my Instagram, A Donahue Baker, at Instagram. Um, you'll see all the programs coming out. Sometimes we're coming to every single NFL city. So if you're close to an NFL city, we're going to be doing networking events at every single NFL city. We'll have influencers. We'll have various people that are instrumental in building generational wealth. So that's going to be a component. Other than that, I am... CEOing and commandeering <laughs> Money Av, the movement, a digital wealth building platform. I am trying to reach, really, I'm trying to reach the young people that are looking to be entrepreneurs, looking to build generational wealth at an early age, because it's better to start now, right? And we're going to do it in a way that's different, right? So if you can't get a loan from a typical institution, come to us. You know, have an account with us. You don't have to put all your money there, but have an account with us. We're hundred percent black owned bank. So we need support from our own community. 100%, 100%, man. 
this is this has been a great episode and what the thing that keeps going through our mind is just that turning point for you very early on when you received that check you know and you had you, you had a choice you know you you could have just tricked it off and nobody would have a problem with it but something within you said you know what let me put this into some property and you know you can imagine like where where life would have been if you decided to go in a different direction you know just that small investment those six units and now you're at 500 and counting and going into development and um just having a bank now um and, and just, creating more millionaires right yep. so that's the whole idea like everything that you just said means nothing if we're not out there creating more entrepreneurs, creating more real estate developers, creating more millionaires. We need you to be millionaires and be unashamed to say it because a million dollars today will not be a million dollars tomorrow. We just went through this $2 trillion stimulus. Inflation is coming. It's time to start building generational wealth. That's really the, the key takeaway. And everybody that's listening that took the time to sit down for an hour and listen to this interview, it could be you, it just takes a choice. It just takes a choice. Go to bankmoneyav.com, join this movement, exchange with us, right? We're not a transactional bank. We don't want to just, for you to open an account, put your paycheck in, you know, and, and get a debit card. No, we want to build with you. We want you to own property. We want you to start an LLC, get that $50,000, right? Get that 50,000 that's not connected to your personal credit profile. Then go out, get a million dollars in debt through your business, through your business. Do like Donald Trump did if you have to. If things get too hot, you know what to do. There it is. I just want to make sure that you see an option, another way. You don't have to do anything illegal. It's easy to make money. My brothers, my sisters, take advantage of this opportunity. Take advantage of Money Ab. Sam is gonna be there and, and, and I'm gonna I'm gonna make sure, Sam, that you come down. Number one, you gotta calm Definitely. down in Jersey. If you go back to Canarsie, you gotta come down, come into our offices in Jersey. And uh, I'm gonna show you all the great people that we're working with. We got a billionaire that's on our board, by the way. We got a wow. billionaire. This billionaire has pledged to put $500 million in play next year, right? So we're looking for wow. people to help build that legacy. We're looking for people that are creators, looking for people that are real estate developers. This is key. So join the movement. Mic drop. <laughs> <laughs> Love it, man. Love it, man. But yeah, I appreciate you uh, coming on, man. It's been a pleasure just hearing your story. I'm excited to put this out. I know our listeners will gain so much from it. So salute to you, man. Appreciate you again. Definitely. My man, appreciate you, brother. So listen, man, let's stay in touch. And uh, whenever you want me back, just say the word, send out the bat signal and we'll make it happen. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Uh, thank you everyone for listening to another episode of the Black Real Estate Dialogue Podcast. I look forward to hearing from you all soon.